All right, people. Okay, we're back on a Sunday with the Bama Elite Podcast, Touchdown Alabama Magazine, streaming this right here on YouTube after the 63 to 7 win over Louisiana Monroe. Crimson Tide did cover that 49 point spread there. We got the three baddest men in the room. We got the man Justin Smith, the lead scouting and recruiting analyst for TDA here. We got the man Patrick Dow, breaking news reporter for TDA, his Patriots warm a day. So big ups there to, uh, to Mac Jones, Bill Belichick on those Patriots. But before we get into before we get to the conversation here, and I'm yours truly, Stephen M. Smith of TDA, i going to always remind you, so when you're not listening to the Bama Elite Podcast right here on YouTube, but you got to check out the Big Game uh, College Football Podcast Network and audio stream. Check them out for the best college football coverage around the South. So when you can't get to us here, the Bama Elite, you go to the Big Game uh, College Football Podcast uh, Network and the audio stream to get that big-time college football coverage. But starting this thing off on a glorious Sunday, uh, Pat, how we doing, man? I'm in a much better mood. Like you said, the Patriots got that uh, got the win over the Steelers today. And, you know, if there's any other Alabama fans paying attention to the NFL, Tua Tungavailo also had a, an insane comeback yeah. today. Boy, was he, was, 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 was he slinging those coconuts and pineapples or what? If you, Yeah, that's one way to put it. But, uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, I mean, epic comeback. And it seems like just he just keeps having a knack for these things. Justin, how are we feeling over there on your end? Yeah, I'm feeling good. Of course, I don't have a NFL team to root for, but I did watch a couple of NFL games today. Caught now, caught the Saints and the Buccaneers. Also caught the Dolphins and Ravens games. Pretty exciting on both sides of the football with Lamar Jackson and Tua going to work. So yeah, I'm pretty good, Steven. I mean, it was fun watching Tua talk about going to get that win. Of course, now you know some people are wondering were we wrong on him, his ability to throw the deep ball, and of course, Mac Jones getting a very big win over the Pittsburgh Steelers. But as we look at just the recap from uh, Alabama, Louisiana Monroe, and uh, what did Alabama correct or try to correct? Of course, a lot of fans would go, well, Bill O'Brien is still the offensive coordinator, so what actually got corrected? But on the positive side of this coin here, one thing I looked at was, uh, Pat, the offensive line. So, uh, I mean, uh, when Tyler Booker, freshman, hit the field. Uh, uh, he did some great things there. He, he got some starts there at right guard. He got some starts at left guard and with the first team offensive line. Coach Saban said after the game, uh, he's a young player that's playing extremely well. Got a lot of confidence in him. Uh, we are going to play him more. Rodell Williams talked about this guy can flat go. He plays with a lot of passion. He plays with a lot of confidence. He will mow you to the ground. Uh, a guy that, whether he plays on the left side or the right side, you see his impact. I know our own Justin Smith. I know Justin uh, self-scouted him during Booker's time at IMG. But just starting off with you, Pat, I mean, uh, is Tyler Booker the, the missing piece here to the offensive line? Is he the piece that's missing to really get this thing solidified? I mean, he could be. This was really kind of our first extended look at him working with the first team group out here against Louisiana Monroe. And you're right. He did do some good things out there, especially in the run game. He's a big physical player. He's, a, I mean, for a freshman, he's, he's really, really, he's got really good size. He's built a little bit more like a tackle, but he, he still has the ability to move his feet and get in there at guard and do some good things. And, you know, like you said, Justin was high on this guy and look, uh, they still have some ways to go. They were they were really good in um in, in the pass protection, but there were still times throughout this game, and I know Alabama was still rotating in Cohen and and Booker into the game. There wasn't really a solid group to be in there the entire time, but you know, still a few concerning things up front. I would say, even even though that they put up a bunch of big numbers and they won sixty three to seven, it still to me felt like there were still a lot of things that they kind of needed to clean up, especially starting up front on the line. Yeah, I agree with um you, Pat. That's 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 kind of the direction that I am going. I think it may we may are we may be starting to see the light at the end of the tunnel. Maybe Alabama has some guys they can fit into the rotation in terms of this offensive line group as whole as a whole, subbing guys in and out. So we saw flashes of how good this offensive line could be, but also like like similar to Utah State, we have to take this grant this this game 
with the brain of salt because it is Louisiana Monroe. I mean, look at, on a couple of plays. I think Bryce Young was going to sleep, was about to go home and um, come back to the game inside the pocket because he had so much time um, to pass the football. So I think we've seen flashes of Alabama's offensive line that, that they can – be consistently good, but the run game definitely still has to have that consistency. And I think that was the biggest um, question mark throughout that U- Louisiana Monroe game, specifically during the first half, because Alabama started off red hot, but then th- their offense stalled out. ULM started to get momentum on the defensive side of football. And in and af- and halftime, when Nick Saban talked to the reporter, he said consistency, consistency, consistency about three times because that is the one thing that Alabama definitely needs to um, establish on both sides of the football. So I think we are starting to see maybe the light at the end of the tunnel. But, yeah, like you said, Pat, Alabama still has some things to figure out up front. One thing that it did – Figure out up front. one thing that I did figure out in the game, guys, is special teams. And uh, if Paul Bear Bryant was living right now, he would be very excited because that was one of the areas where Coach Bryant really harped on was special teams. And after not having a non-offensive touchdown against Utah State and Texas, boy, the Crimson Tide broke out with three. Uh, two of those on special teams: Brian Branch, 68-yard punt return touchdown. Uh, Ja'Cory Brooks blocking his second career punt. Malachi Moore picking it up and scoring a touchdown. It was good to see Malachi Moore back in the end zone for the first time since his freshman year. And then, you know, Kool-Aid McKinstry uh, averaged, you know, 27 yards per punt return. He had a couple. He could have he could have broke back the house. Isaiah Bond got involved in there. So, I mean, Pat, when uh, Coach Saban challenged these guys, we got to get more explosive plays on special teams. I remember – Steve Sarkeesian said, you know, in 2020, you want to do so many things well that you put all the more stress on, on an opposing team. And so when Alabama is able to have that success there on special teams, whether it's blocking a kick, blocking a punt, uh, returning a punt back for a touchdown, when you're having that type of success, you know, how does that, in your opinion, jumpstart the offense and the defense when special teams is in a groove like that? Well, I mean, it really helps out the offense, and particularly particularly this offense, because I actually think that the punt return game, especially Cooley McKinstry, who I think he he must I think he broke a school record in terms of punt return. Steven, you would know better than me about that stuff, but I think that the punt return game actually covered up a lot of stuff for the offense because it gave them the opportunity to work with a lot of short fields during the game, and so whatever struggles they were having they, that they were they what they would have had going going eighty yards, instead they just had to go forty or forty five. So, I mean, the punt return game, can, and Nick Saban made a note of it to, that he challenged his team going into this week to have more of an impact on special teams, play more with a little more cons- consistency and intensity on, in that realm of the game. And, look, it really paid off in a big way. And just looking back at that Texas game, look how, my, how much special teams affected that game positively for Texas with the punts going back, putting in Alabama in unfavorable positions. And Alabama really worked on the punt return game this week, and it really, it really showed up. Go, yeah, back punt- to- oh, go ahead, Justin. My bad. Yeah, special, special teams um definitely was um an important part of that game against UL. Specifically, like you guys said, returning the football, guys like Kool Aid McKinstry and Brian Branch making plays when it comes to the punt return game. But I'm 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 with Pat again. I think it covered up a lot of things Alabama's offense struggled with them throughout this game, and I think those non offensive touchdowns did the same because I think it was it was three. So. About if you take away those, I think the score is like 14-7 at halftime. The game is a lot, a lot closer at halftime if you take yeah. away those run offensive touchdowns. So um I think Alabama's offense definitely has to be more consistent, more consistent as a whole. I think that's something that Nick Saban constantly talks about. So he's gonna consistently talk about that moving forward. But yeah, special teams was definitely a um highlight of this game. Um Kool-Aid McKinstry going back to his high school high school roots because he was a wide receiver, a dynamic returner at Pennsylvania Valley High School in Pinson, Alabama. But Alabama's um, offense definitely has um, some things to fix. And a good return game, a punt return, can definitely help your offense out getting them in favorable field position each time. Going back to that record, Pat, you were talking about. So the the record was 75 years old. Uh, Alabama had 204 punt return yards going back to 1947 in November of 1947 against LSU. In this game, it had 262 punt return yards, so it broke a 75-year-old record uh, right there for the Crimson Tide. But before we get into the things that need to be cleaned up, there was a thought there 
in at the chat now here on YouTube, and one, one of the listeners was talking about, you know, uh, Deontay Lawson and Kendrick Blackshire. You know, both of those two came in the game, uh, did some really good things. Deontay Lawson flashed a lot. I mean, he was sticking his nose in everywhere, flying everywhere. Uh, Kendrick Blackshaw, the same thing. Uh, the future at that inside linebacker position is very special. I mean, you know, I mean, after you graduate Henry Toto and Jalen Moody off to the next level here, you can look at Deontay Lawson, you look at Kendrick Blackshear, you look at uh, Giad Campbell, you look at Sean Murphy, uh, the future, Justin, and all of these guys, Justin, you spent a great deal of time around, especially Deontay Lawson. So the future at that spot, you could throw Ian Jackson in there also, but the future at that spot inside linebacker, especially with the way Lawson and Blackshire have played with been in, the future's bright at that spot. Yeah, most definitely. The future is bright. Just taking a look at who they have lined up at inside linebacker. I think they, most of those guys are five stars. So they were at least five stars heading into the college football level in terms of Jihad Campbell, Sean Murphy. Also, I think Deontay Lawson was a was a five star in many places, even though I think it's four star, five star. Kendrick Blackshear was a high high ranking four star. So the the future is definitely bright when it comes to inside linebacker position. Those guys were rated as like thumper thumper guys, guys who can really make tackles, forceful hits, can lower the boom in terms of making plays. So yeah, I think the future is bright. But looking at Alabama's current inside linebackers, I think total total flash um in this particular matchup. Again, it's against ULM, so we can't like say we can't go crazy like he's the next great Alabama linebacker. But he did show some improvement in terms of specifically when blitzing. He finally got home. I think he got a sack in that particular matchup. And Alabama was definitely dialing up the pressure. And I think a lot of guys did a better job at blitzing. And I think if if you guys pay attention to it, I know a lot of people are saying um Pete Golding is dialing up the pressure in this particular matchup, but that is his game plan a lot of times. He does it, but those guys don't consistently get home. They did have a little bit more success um during that in this particular matchup. So I guess that was another bright spot. But those young inside linebackers, um, yeah, they flash in terms of their physicality and playing with a different level of intensity. But of course, they are still learning, which is one of the reasons why they're not consistently on the field. But Deontay Lawson seems seems to be getting more and more playing time a little bit earlier in important games right now. Yeah, I think I noticed that Lawson, I'm seeming correct me if I'm wrong again, but I think Lawson got in the, in the rotation really early in with Toe Toe. And I know he did. He, he did. Lawson he was in and Jalen Moody were competing for that last spot going in going all throughout fall camp and Look, he could be a guy who that may be able to break through, but Jalen Moody, I think, is actually playing pretty well, too. So Alabama has some good depth there. I know everyone, I, for whatever reason, everyone likes to rate, get some, uh, un, in my opinion, unnecessary hate on Henry Toto. And I know he played really, really well. It, it is ULM, but, you know, they have a lot of good depth there at the middle linebacker position. Before we get into kind of, I guess, the things that got to continue to be worked on here, uh, one thing for certain guys is nobody has a problem with Alabama's running back room. I mean, Jameer Gibbs uh, is leading your team in terms of receiving aspect as a running back. Uh, Jace McClellan showing you his speed is back. Roydell Williams had a whole series where he was shaking and moving and scoring. But a guy that really stood out to me, uh, Justin, Jamarian Miller. I feel like the more this young man grows, he, he could be something. He was at Tyler Legacy High School, Tyler, Texas. I think he had over 5,000 yards across his four-year career there. And when, when, when you watch him play, he's kind of got that pinball mentality. He bounces off guys. He lowers his shoulder. He's got some speed. Uh, uh, Rodell Williams was very high, raving praise upon Jamarian Miller. When you watched him in high school, Justin, did, did you see any of these traits, skill sets in this young man? Because, I mean, Emmanuel Henderson came out a little bit higher than Jamarian Miller, but you, we're already seeing Miller higher on the depth chart in, in terms of that running back position than Henderson. What did you like from Miller out of high school? I think I think the the words that come to mind is he's an old school type of running back, a physical downhill type of running back, a guy who's going to fight for every single yard. We did a reaction video to his highlights, and that is the title of the reaction. He's an old school running back, so I think that is the first thing that came to mind when watching his film. And Alabama needs a running back, I feel, that goes a little bit more downhill and fights for those yards. And I think there is an argument that Rodell Williams may be 
their best guy. I think Jameer Gibbs and Jason McCullen are really effective running backs in terms of catching football out of the backfield, those zone runs, those outside runs. Alabama has been successful at during um early in the season. But I think Rodell Williams can get downhill really effectively. I think we saw flashes of that falling forward, always falling forward, making sure that he's never stopped behind the line of scrimmage. So I think Rodell Williams is a guy, I think, who could get more looks in the future. And I go back to that Texas game. Um, I know it's like fourth and one. Who was in the backfield now? Alabama needed that one part. They gave the ball to Rodell Williams. So I think there is some confidence there in terms of him being a downhill, physical type of running back. Guys want to lower his shoulder, run behind his pass. So I think Rodell Williams is a guy to watch moving forward in terms of being a guy Alabama may lean on later in the game because we all know it's going to be a game where Alabama is pro- probably in the lead late. We, we got to lean on the run game. We turn around the clock. We can't give, the, give this team's offense another chance. Let's lean on the run game. Get a guy who can run downhill consistently get five yards, six yards, 10 yards right here to just close out the game. And Rodell Williams may be that guy, and I think he showed flashes of that. Of course, again, it's against ULM, but I think he is a guy who can be like that because th- that is the type of running back who he was at Hurricane High School. Yeah, you definitely need some grinders there in the backfield, and Rodell is a physical back, and Jamari Miller definitely is a physical running back because at the end of the game, he absolutely trucked that guy, that uh, poor, poor guy ULM. I think he went down on the play. So hopefully he's okay. His, but family, he's, his family is still looking for him, Pat. Yeah, but M- Miller Miller is a really physical player. And look, I think he only played in uh, I maybe I'm again, I might be wrong. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think he only played a, into the into the start of the fourth quarter, but he immediately became Alabama's second leading rusher during the game. So look, he's Alabama needs some of these grinders in the backfield because when you're trying to run out the clock in some of these games. You know, it's great to get the 60 yards, but you really got to be sure you want to get the four, the five yard carries really bleed that clock. And Rodell Williams and maybe maybe even Jamari Miller down the line, down the line for sure. But Rodell Williams definitely could fit that role for them. As we look at now, my man, uh, Dallas Danner writes in, Trey Sanders did well also, which he did. Trey Sanders had a few nice runs They're himself. Just, they got yeah. so many options. There's I mean, so they, many they got, options. Got, I mean, they even had the walk on Jonathan Bennett out there. And, and Jonathan Bennett even had, you know, a couple of good runs in there. But now as we flip to the things that still need work, and of course, if you go over the chat line, everybody's hopping on Bill O'Brien. Everybody's hopping on Bill O'Brien. If you go to Twitter, if you go to Instagram, if you go to any form of social media, the first cry is, can we just part ways from Ben O'Brien? Now, of course, the rumors out there, Nebraska looking for a new head coach after letting go of Scott Frost. Urban Meyer's name has been thrown out there. Ben O'Brien's name has been thrown out there. Uh, but, uh, but, 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 but Pat, and, and, I, and I know, Pat, you've been a, a little bit of a defender of O'Brien in a sense of it's like, it, what, what do you expect the man to do? The receivers aren't getting separation. You know, this is not working. That's not working. What do you expect them to do? But uh, when, when you look at another game where you go to the people, of course, because I guess, you know, you know the fans kind of drive a lot of the conversation. When you go to the people, it's still Bill O'Brien frustration. Uh, what, what do you say to that, Pat, as, 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 as a person who, you know, O'Brien was a part of your Patriots. Yeah, he was a part of the Patriots for one year. Um I guess I've been kind of deemed the Bill O'Brien defender. I mean, I, I guess, but um, look, there are look there are some things that he can do better. But a lot of this just comes down to execution. There is there's the old uh, the Knicks the quote the Knicks Saban likes to say all the time. And sometimes it's not about the play you call; it's about the players you got running it. And whether that means that they need to incorporate different guys in the receiver room, or maybe they need to get some guys back like Tyler Harrell or, or Jojo Earl to kind of jumpstart the passing game. But I do think that Alabama's offense functioned better and they did it at the start of the game to go a little bit more up tempo, try to put more pressure on the defense and, you know, get getting, getting in, getting that tempo involved doesn't happen unless you're gaining positive yards, whether that's through the passing game or the running game. And in the second quarter, things looked rough in the run game and the pass game. Nothing was really, really working. And still bleeding over to this game, you know, Bryce Young still working. It seems to be working on that chemistry with the with the bulk of his receivers room. I think he's good with Trayshawn Holden. Uh, him, the two of them are roommates, good friends. 
he's got the connection with Gibbs in the check down. And he finally got Cameron Latu involved heavy on, on one of the last drives in the second quarter. We had three catches in that drive alone. But every but those were the only three players who had multiple catches for Alabama during this game. So I and even and also I think it was never more apparent that they just need a little bit more work on timing and whatnot with the throw to Jacory Brooks that went off his hands and was picked off. And you know, Brooks did get he he got two hands on the football, but it was a little bit high and behind him. It's, it just wasn't it just wasn't the perfect play. It wasn't timed out right. The, both of them could have done a little bit better on that one. It ended up getting picked off. But you know, mistakes like that could be more costly in closer games. So look, yeah, Bill O'Brien can he can he do a better job? Sure, but I think it also comes down to the players on the field executing a little bit better. Yeah, I think um, it's a like I'm always gonna say. I think it's a mix. You're he is the coach. I guess you got to get some of the blame, but I do think it is sort of timing. Seems as if m- most teams are going to play Alabama with the split safety look. Um, trying to take away the deep ball, and like you said, Pat, Alabama is missing some speedy wide receivers who could take the top off of defenses. And if you are a safety and you feel that there is no one on this field who can get past me with the elite game breaking type of speed i'm going to play a little bit more confident in terms of coming downhill making plays and i think these are some young wide receivers still trying to work on the chemistry in terms of the chemistry with bryce young with them being new wide receivers um trying to when no win and need to sit down here in this in this particular spot in the zone hey he's going to he most likely hit me as soon as i come out of this route so i think that is going to come down to some more timing situations but i think alabama definitely needs to find a way to get more speed on the football field, trying to connect down down the field a little bit better because it didn't it really didn't down on me until Nick Saban said how basically it was hard for them to push the ball downfield because of the split safety look. Alabama hasn't done a tremendous job of getting the ball downfield in terms of one one big play. So I think that is something they definitely have to work on. Possibly have to get more speed on the field. I know that like I like we said, Kobe Princess has that four three speed, but like in that first game, I think they want to use him more so. In space, I'm not really take them deep and take the top off of off of defense. So I think having more speedy wide receivers coming back, like Tyler Harrow, I mean JoJo Earl, I think those guys have the capability of doing that. You know, Christian Leary has some speed, made some exciting plays down the field in the A Day game. So maybe he can possibly find his way back into the rotation because Isaiah Bond is a guy who has a lot of speed as well. He was a speedy wide receiver. He seems to have jumped to Leary on the depth chart in ter- terms of how fast he's getting on the field. At the moment, a guy who I was really high on coming out of Louisiana is Aaron Anderson. He's another speedy, explosive wide receiver who I think can make some plays down the field because he's one of those wide receivers who play more so in the air, not on the ground, can make plays at the highest point, high point, the football down the field. But he's, of course, he's injured, so we haven't been able to see him at his full capacity. So it's, it's going to be interesting to see how Alabama works out things in terms of the wide receiver position, but I definitely feel – they have some things they have to figure out. And I don't think I don't think it is a talent issue. I think they have the talent. I think, it's, I think it has to come with talent, um, chemistry, and Bill O'Brien because he is a coach. Um, if you, you should know your personnel. Let's find a way to get them to football. So I think he has to get some of the blame, but I think it's a mixed bag. When I look at this, guys, and, and stick with this to you, Justin, for Bryce Young, I mean, how does he go about working that chemistry, though, with these young guys because he's got it as pat mentioned with treshawn holden they they coming up in california they were in high school camps together they were at seven on sevens together and on elevens elite eleven, all that type of stuff you know he and holden were a part of that you know together but when you look at an isaiah bond when you look at a uh a, a kendrick law a shaz preston you know some of the kobe prentice a lot of these young guys that jacory brooks even even though he and Brooks played together last year, you know, how does Bryce really work that chemistry, you know, with these guys that so that it doesn't appear to be frustrating? Because going back to ULM, you know, there was serious miscommunication between Isaiah Bond and, and Bryce for a play, and that, that ball gets picked off. I mean, there's miscommunication between, uh, you know, Bryce and Ja'Cory Brooks in the play that got picked off. I mean, I know he overshot uh, Jermaine Burton on a long ball, but for Bryce, after the way he was able to connect with Jamison Williams and John Mechie, you know, just a season ago, how do you work that, Justin, with this group of receivers that talented, young, but the talent's there? Simple reps. I think that's the simplest um, answer. You just have to get consistent reps and practice. And Nick Saban talks about it all the time. You want to create those game-like situations as much as possible, as 
close to game like situation as you can during a practice week. And Alabama seems to seem to do that specifically in terms of the two minute situation, try to create game like situations as much as possible, continuing to work together. It, it just all comes down to reps. I think the talent is there, but things definitely have to be um, figured out. So I think, I think the answer to that question is pretty simple. What reps, repetition, trying to be consistent, consistently get reps together, get more comfortable with each other, which I guess is a little bit sort of more difficult now during the football season than most likely um, during um, fall camp or during the more so off season. But I think reps is a simple answer to that. Yeah, reps and, consistent, and consistency has been something that Nick Saban has been preaching for weeks now. Just everyone trying to play consistent winning football. And it's and even with the receivers, they just got to get on the practice field, work with Bryce Young and, uh, you know, if you don't think Alabama has the talent, I'm sorry to tell you, they, they do. They have four and five stars all across their roster. They have good players. They just need to, they, you know, and they have a lot of young guys that are in the mix in the depth chart. So some of those guys just kind of got to figure it out. The big thing here, guys, and I, and I threw this question to Coach Saban toward the end or at the end of his postgame press conference, the tight end position. Alabama's got to get the tight ends more involved. And we, we saw, like you mentioned, Pat, Cameron Latou, had three catches there in the second quarter on a drive. He finished with three catches for 51 yards, including Sky in for a ball. And then you got Amari Nyblack, who Justin saw heavily on the recruiting trail at 6'4", 230 pounds, can play tight end. But you could also stretch him out wide as a receiver. He caught a touchdown pass uh, from Bryce Young in the matchup. Tight ends are such, are such mismatches. They're bigger than corners and safeties. They run faster than linebackers. You got to design some plays to work them in. Saban even mentioned Joe Cox, tight ends coach, one of the brightest young coaches he's ever been around. So, Pat, they, they, they've got to be able to incorporate more of Latou in this offense, more of Nye Black in this offense. I get it. Uh, Kitzelman and Robbie Oots, most of your blocking guys. But Nye Black, Cam Latou, and as you keep developing Danny Lewis Jr., those three have to get design plays. Yeah, that's a – I mean, it's a good tight end room, and he's really high on Joe Cox, like we said. And I know Nick Saban doesn't necessarily – has said in the past also that they don't necessarily call plays that are directly for players, but maybe you should when you have so many mismatches, mis mismatches like Latou and Nye Black. Just, I mean, just look on that drive alone. Latu had three catches. And he went up and over one of the defenders to make a play that brought Alabama inside the twenty. So, and he's one of their more experienced guys. And I, I just think that it would go go some some ways in extending some of these drives, especially on third down. I know we glossed over it again. Alabama put up sixty three points, but they're actually pretty bad on third down. They were one of six on the day. And I think finding someone like Latu and making sure that he's running the right routes in terms of force, whether like Nick Saban said, they want to make sure they're running the correct routes at the right depths and whatnot to make sure they pick up some of these extra yardages. So I think just just incorporating him along with his experience, I think that it would go a long ways for this offense. As we now, as we now try to – before we get to the next topic here, we got to go to our latest sponsor here, Pat. we got uh, prize picks. And uh, what they got for us, Pat? Yeah, prize picks. Uh, new – one of our new partners for this program here, and you know, new uh, daily fantasy app for you guys to check out. And so, price picks. So for price picks, all first-time users that deposit and use our uh, use our promo code will receive one hundred instant deposit, one a one hundred percent instant deposit match up to a hundred dollars. So if you deposit one hundred dollars, price price picks will give you back one hundred dollars. Price picks is the best way to have action on the game in states like California, Florida, Texas, Georgia. In over 70% of the United States. Price Picks is currently operational in over 30 states and Canada. So how does it work? You pick two to five players, and if they go and if they go score more or less than the, their Price Picks projections, you can win up to 10 times your money on any entry. At Price Picks, you aren't competing against other people. It's just you versus the projections available. Price Picks offers projections on any sport that you watch. That includes NFL, NBA, MLB. NHL, PGA, college football, men's and women's college basketball, soccer, WNBA, esports, NASCAR, tennis, MMA, boxing, disc golf, Euro basketball, cricket, and more. Prize picks entries can be made in 60 seconds or less. It's that easy. Prize picks is safe and offers fast withdrawals. Download Prize picks today and, and play daily fantasy sports with us. Make sure to use the code promo code BAMA100. Again, BAMA100 when you sign up. And 
I we, we really encourage you guys to check out Prize Picks. There's a, it's a really cool, neat fantasy, daily fantasy app, and it's a lot of fun. So I hope you guys can check it out. Yeah, gotcha. definitely. Um, yeah, de- yeah, definitely a lot of fun. Um, to use the app. Um, any sports fan, Alabama fan. So I know a lot of times a lot of stuff is specifically turns toward turn towards the NFL. But with this, um, you can incorporate um your Alabama football team into this. Um, I think Bryce Young was one. Bryce Young had a lot of them on the board um this past um weekend. I know the one of them was like 19 rushing yards. Just get on there from um, project um will he go more more or less of that then. You possibly can win some prizes. So, no, I love my fans. I'm some knowledgeable football fans. So, go win some prizes with that promo code BAMA100. Be sure to check that out. Prize picks here. Appreciate Pat there for that read. So, guys, uh, continuing with the things that needing to be uh, corrective here as we move forward as Bama gets into SEC play this week against Vanderbilt. The uh, Alabama defensive secondary saw some <laughs> good things from Terry on Arnold. Saw some good things from him uh, in the second half. We did see Eli Ricks. He did get out there uh, during the second half. Kool-Aid McKinstry still the starter uh, with Terry on Arnold. Uh, Kyrie Jackson, the backup there, second teamer with Eli Ricks. So, Pat, just starting with you, I, I know it's ULM that they didn't really attack much. Uh, the secondary, if any at all, I mean, they attacked with some short passes, but – not too many deep vertical throws there, but did, did you see from your vantage point anything that the secondary worked on, got better at, improved upon? Well, I mean, it's obvious. You really can't take much from ULM because I don't think they really have the guys to challenge them downfield like you would have liked to see. And, you know, so maybe some of those deep, deep like getting beat, getting beat deep like they did against Texas, maybe that stuff's still there, but you know, I thought the corners played pretty well, especially guys like Kool-Aid McKinstry. I think Terry Arnold, to me, seems like the most impressive one today, and he was, wasn't was necessarily the guy everyone was looking for uh, to step up ahead of the season. But I think Terry and Arnold is, in my opinion, is moving pretty close to securing a starting spot back there. Yeah, yeah I, th- I got a lot of confidence in Terry on Arnold as well. I know I like Eli Ricks, but I think it's getting to a point where Kool-Aid McKinstry and Terry on have are playing consistent right now. So they are I think they are the front runner duo in terms of being the consistent starters at cornerback. But that competition will most likely um continue to go on heading into this week um with Vanderbilt. I think Vanderbilt has a more talented quarterback probably than ULM. So maybe Alabama's cornerback can get cornerbacks can get a bigger test um the upcoming week. So yeah, I really like my corner. I think the biggest thing is his confidence. I think when you're a confident cornerback things um really come together for you specifically when the ball is in the air you are confident so you don't overreact you're not panicking possibly get a pass interference you're waiting you're waiting on when the wide receiver turns around when the wide receiver puts up his hands um you're just um being patient so you're confident I think so I think Terry Arnold is a confident cornerback at the moment so I think Kool-Aid McKinstry and Arnold may be the guys Alabama goes with um moving forward moving forward here I do I really like Eli Ricks's um skill set I, I really like he brings to the table but Arnold and McKinstry played well this um, last game, so I think they will be the two um, starters most likely moving forward, but the competition will most likely um, continue. But I think the players who have played consistent it looks 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 in terms of the secondary, you have to look at guys like and DeMarco Helms, although they're not making flashy plays, I guess they're playing um, consistent, although Alabama hasn't really – like you said, we, we, it's ULM, so we, we're, not, we're not really sure what, what we can take. From that, we have to go. We have to see Alabama go up against a team that is going to stretch the field a little bit more. Before we get into this defensive line and wrap some things up here, guys, a, a cool thing happened over the weekend. Both of the Brockemeyer brothers took the field. I mean, Tommy and James Brockemeyer, they both got out there. The pride of, of Texas, the Texas legacy right there. Uh, Tommy got in at left tackle. James got in at center, working with the uh, the final group there in the fourth quarter. They created some running lanes there for Jamarian Miller and uh, Jonathan Bennett, the walk-on. And, you know, Justin, you spent a great deal of time scouting out the Brockemeyer boys and being around you know, their father, Blake Brockemeyer, Texas legend, and played in the NFL as well. So just seeing both of those two out there in the fourth quarter, I mean, Justin, what did that do for you? I know a lot of fans are saying, you know, what happened with the Brockemeyers? They were supposed to be this. They were supposed to be that. And, they're not hitting what we thought that they would reach. But for a lot of players, it takes them longer than what some expect for them to, to get it. I mean, for some players, they come in, 
They instantly get it. They have it down. They're ready to go. And then for others, it, it, it takes them kind of going through some, some, some growing pains. And for the Brock Amara boys, it's it taken the growing pains there. But what, what did you see from just watching them on the field together there for that first time? Well, I, it, like, like, like with a lot of these guys, I cover a lot of them. It, it does feel good to actually see them get on the field at some, some point in time to play. So I was really excited to see those guys. I was excited to see a lot of guys finally get an opportunity to at least get on the field with it being a blowout, get an opportunity to get your feet wet a little bit. So you had guys like Jeremiah Alexander getting on the field in terms of an edge rusher. Tim Keenan was able to get some some snaps. Um, I think Damon Payne was able to get some snaps. Antonio Kite got some snaps a little bit later in the game. So I think it's always good for those um young guys to at least get on the field experience on um, how it feels to play in a real game. But like you said, Stephen, those guys still have to figure some things out in terms of being consistent and learning things and possibly find a way um, to get on the football field because it isn't going to get any easier because Alabama has a special, another special offensive line class coming in, a massive offensive line class. You're talking about a class with three guys who are six foot seven. I think they may be, they are, they are maybe going to be the tallest guys on the roster as soon as they walk into the building. So Justin, the small, the smallest guy is right. Where's McElderry at six, three. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they definitely have some um things to figure out because it's not gonna get any easier. But it was good to see a lot of those um young guys play. Um, I know a lot of people are liking what they're seeing from Jamario and Miller. I think he's coming to uh, coming um together really well. I know we talked about Manuel Henderson earlier. Why um, Jamario Miller have, has probably jumped him in terms of the run, running back depth. Um, Henderson definitely has to add on some weight before he's able to consistently run the football in the SEC and move him to wide receiver. And he looks he looks apart already because he. Definitely Definitely has to do some things to build up his body to withstand some hits in the SEC. So we'll, we will see what Alabama does with them in the future in terms of possibly a wide receiver or running back. But, yeah, I, I was happy to see a lot of those guys get some playing time. Yeah, it was great to see a lot of those guys get, get in the game. And Alabama putting a lot of walk-ons there in the last kneel down. So it's always great to see. But, you know, in terms of the Brockemeyer brothers, like we said, they were highly recruited. And Alabama seems to recruit the offensive line really well. But – uh Look, you know, it, since those guys came to campus, it always kind of felt like one or both of them was on had some sort of injury or something. So just to see them both back on the field, I think that's just really good to see. I, I, absolutely, because I remember when they signed their national letter of intent, they they both were hurt. You know, one was on crutches, one was on the knee scooter. You know, Tommy Brockemeyer has had some issues with his knee. Uh, James, I'm not quite sure what the deal was there, but it, it was just nice seeing both of those two young men on the field uh, with the offensive line uh, blocking and, and, and having fun out there. And, and like you mentioned, Justin, for a lot of these young guys, it's getting a feel for you're inside Bryant Denny. You're getting a feel for you're playing college football. You're doing something that you've always wanted to do. So getting those reps, getting that experience and, and getting that confidence out there is going to be a, it, it's a big, big thing. But as we wrap this thing up, folks, and remember, if you're not able to catch the Bama Elite, you go to the Big Game College Football Podcast Network and audio stream, and you check out that right there. It'll give you the best college football around the South. But as we look at this week of practice, Pat, you're preparing for Vanderbilt. SEC game. Yes, folks will say, but it's Vanderbilt. They're in the SEC. So you're preparing for this game. Tyler Steen going up against his former team this week. Even though we can't be in practice, hate that you know we can't be in practice pat what, what are you looking forward from hearing in practice this week about these guys getting ready for now the sec schedule i mean again i sound like a broken record but just figuring out that final offensive line spot i just think that's that's can solve a lot of issues for alabama because if they're having if there's just not miscommunication or whatever it's still some growing pains in the receiver room if you can run the ball consistently it's going to cover that up and set it up even more so just seeing the battle between booker and cohen just throughout the week and just see who rises to the top that's what i'm most looking forward to hearing about yeah i'm, a, I'm looking forward to just more consistency across the board i think that's the only thing that we can really um look for in terms of them trying to get better is vanderbilt so we may, we might can learn some. We might not be able to learn something. But I'm pretty sure Alabama, Alabama said Coach Nick Saban's gonna have them um, tune in on this game, make sure that they respect every opponent and everything. So I think just them consistently getting better because their schedule is getting looks if it's getting tougher and tougher by the week because the teams they have coming in the line are looking really, 
really good. The SEC West in particular and SEC as a whole is looking very, very strong. I mean, I go back, guys. I was watching, rewatching the uh, Mississippi State LSU game. I mean, State had that one. Mississippi State had that one. If not for a muffed punt, you know, that, that, that game could have went the completely opposite direction. But uh, absolutely, I mean, this game right here against Vanderbilt, you got to go out there, uh, handle business if you're Alabama, because right after that, uh, October 1, you go to Arkansas. Uh, K.J. Jefferson, Sam Pittman, uh, the way Drew Sanders is playing, uh, that's a good football thing. Yeah, and also like the team, two teams you mentioned, Mississippi State and LSU. Mississippi State has some has can put up points offensively. And Mike Leach is a Will you know, Rogers. Jack. Will Rogers. Will Rogers is good. Underrated quarterback. Yeah, and also like the let's uh, Alabama better hope I, if and they have a brutal uh, they have a brutal road stretch to end the season. They better hope LSU doesn't figure things out. Because going into LSU and then going to Ole Miss the next week, on top of going to Tennessee and going to Arkansas, if they, it could be an absolutely brutal stretch. Yeah, I'm excited. I'm really excited for the Arkansas matchup because I think the Razorbacks are a tough team. I think they're physical. Just like I think they, I think they, I think they just do a great job of embodying who their head who their head coach is. So I'm really excited to see Alabama face off against the Arkansas Razorbacks because there's a physical team. So you better come with your hard hat ready to work because they go, they are going to make you work. So, yeah, it's some good games down the line for Alabama. It's SEC is looking very strong. I know a lot of people don't want to look towards Georgia way, Georgia's way because they're not on the schedule, but the Bulldogs are looking really good, like the number one team in the nation defense. It's looking really, really good. So I know that is down the line. Alabama has a lot of work to do because, like you said, this schedule is strong, but the SEC is looking really good. I know I said that would wrap it up, but Justin just brought another thing in here. So, so this is going to wrap it up right here. Is Georgia is Georgia the model now? Because you're starting to see a lot of people bring that to the conversation table. Well, you got to be Georgia. Georgia's the measuring stick. Georgia's the standard. We we, we got to be right there. You know, with with Georgia, it, it, it has Georgia, in your opinion, starting to talk with you, Justin. Has Georgia become the model in college football? No, I, I, I wouldn't say they've become the model. I, I don't think they've taken a crown from Alabama just yet, but they are very close to doing it. I think they have to beat Alabama a couple, probably another time again, win another national championship to take that crown away. But this that team, is, that team looks really good. It looks like the Alabama of old in terms of just plugging guys in, getting freshmen who, who just seem to come out of nowhere, and their freshmen are coming in and playing and ready to play some football. I know some guys put in Malachi Starks in the chat. He's a freshman who just rolled into their defense, ready to play, making plays. You have a guy like I think Michael Williams, is who's a, fresh, who's a freshman who's a high school player last year, coming in, ready to make plays. So Georgia specifically on the defense side of football, watching them, I'm like, yo, who is going to make the play next? A different guy seems to step up every single play. So Georgia is really, really good. Stetson Bennett has definitely taken a step forward in my mind. I don't think they have a lot of great wide receivers, but the tight end room is insane. Brock Bowers, I I think they made that guy in the lab somewhere because he's really, really um special. So I think Georgia definitely has a great team. Um, I know Alabama like ha has some things to figure out before they possibly have to face them in the future, but I'm really liking what I'm seeing from Georgia in terms of them as a team and as a program. Yeah, so I actually think we're talking about two different things right now. Yeah. So is Georgia, in my opinion, is Georgia better than Alabama? Yes, I think Georgia looks better than Alabama right now. If they played, I would guess that Georgia would win. But in terms of being the model for college football, you know, Georgia won a national championship last year. They had these great recruiting classes. They're smoking teams. Do that for the next 15 years like Alabama did, and then you will be the model of college football. And even then, Kirby Smart and Georgia's model, it's an Alabama model. He comes from the Nick Saban tree. So it's an Alabama. And they, like Justin said, they look like Alabama old. So, yeah. Are they the model of, of all of college football? It's way too early to tell that. They could morph into it, but, you know, they got to do this thing for the next decade in order to, to, in order to convince, convince me that they are, they are the model and the standard. Or Alabama's got to fall off a cliff. And as long as Nick Saban's there, I don't really see that necessarily happening. And there's Pat Dow taking that major shot right there to roll us on out of the show. Well, folks, it's the Bama Elite Podcast. Yours truly, Stephen M. Smith, Justin Smith, lead scout and recruiting analyst for TDA. Patrick Dow, breaking news reporter for TDA, coming on here on a Sunday, recapping Alabama, Louisiana, Monroe, 
What did Alabama correct heading forward to the SEC slate? What things need to still be corrected? Should be a very good week of practice for Coach Saban and the Crimson Tide this Sunday. Bama takes on Vandy. Well, guys, until Thursday, this is the Bama Elite. Appreciate everybody. We'll see you Thursday.